Welcome everyone as you're coming into this room. Um, I'm Sheila Murray. I am project director with Community Resilience to Extreme Weather. And again, we're so pleased to have you all with us today. Um, and it's a very exciting uh, project that we're, we, we've had a wonderful time with and we're very happy to share. Um, I am uh, going to offer an, a land acknowledgement before we, before we begin. Uh, and I'll do that right now. We want to acknowledge the land on which we work has been a site of human activity for over 15,000 years. Toronto, Tacaronto, is the traditional ter ter territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We further acknowledge that Toronto, Tacaronto, is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We recognize the problematic and harmful history of colonial land dispossession and that Mississaugas and Chippewa have fought for their rights and compelled more recent settlements with the Government of Canada in relation to those treaties. Today, we are presenting learning from our work in the St. Jamestown neighborhood, which sits beside what settlers now call the Don River and Valley Chain. For thousands of years, the mouth of the river was an important gathering place of indigenous people who lived in the region. The Anishinaabemowin, a uh, name for that is Mongskotanush, and there are several translations, um, one of which is, and I think this is lovely, burning bright point. Um, and it, it may refer to the practice of torchlight salmon spearing on the river where the Mississaugas of the Credit had a seasonal settlement to fish and to hunt. Many of the residents of St. Jamestown are newcomers and we have started to walk together in this valley to connect with this land. As we do this, we are reminded of our responsibilities as settlers and newcomers to disrupt colonialism, recognize and support the rights of indigenous people and learn how to care for the land. So again, many thanks to all of you for joining us today from all across the country and welcome. Um, I'm gonna take just a few minutes to tell you about who we are and our work together on this project. Um, after that, you'll see a short video that will give you a very good sense of the issues and adorations our project neighborhood, St. Jamestown. And then you're gonna meet four young people who are members of their own St. Jamestown Climate Action Crew. They will be presenting the heat wave protocol. That's the work we've been doing, um, which will continue to be a living document. And then we'll finish up with learnings and recommendations on going forward. Um, at, at our hour, when we reach one o'clock, um, we're going to invite anybody who's able and interested to stay on the call. Um, and we can have um, we can have a, a question and answer session and discussion. So who are we in this? What has proved to be a deeply rewarding collaboration? Um, Community Resilience to Extreme Weather, my organization crew was formed nearly 10 years ago in response to extreme flooding and the ice storm that hit Toronto hard in 2013. We saw an opportunity to communicate climate change issues to Toronto residents through the lens of social networks that can look out for each other when things go wrong. It's about emergency preparedness, equitable access to green spaces and food security. Our focus is on the communities that will be disproportionately impacted by climate change and who lack the resources to remove themselves from harm. The Toronto Environmental Alliance, or T, and I'm sure many of you know them, um, has, been, has been working for more than 30 years to build a greener, healthier, and more equitable Toronto. T works with people, workers, academics, community groups, governments, and organizations, encouraging the participation of local people on local issues. And, uh, Last but certainly not least, the St. Jamestown Climate Action Crew is made up of 13 trained crew volunteers aged 15 to 82. All of them have volunteered with crew over the past years. In 2023, they decided to organize in order to establish a collective voice 
that advocates on local issues and continues to catalyze neighbors around a response to climate impacts. And now I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about the project. So T and crew started working with local volunteers in St. Jamestown in 2022 to co-create and implement a community-led emergency response model for extreme weather events focused on heat wave preparedness and local response. This project, Community-Led Climate Solutions for Vertical Communities, is funded by the Commission for Environmental Co Cooperation through its EJ4 grant, and we are also very grateful for additional funding from the City of Toronto's Environment and Climate Division. Over the, the last 20 months, it's been a process, a great one, um, we have trained and supported local volunteer leaders and high-rise residents to lead community outreach during a heat wave. Volunteers have learned how neighbors can help prevent heat related illnesses and deaths and how to prepare for many emergency events, events such as power outage during a heat wave or storm. We've also held workshops with local residents and stakeholders such as community agencies and city staff to develop and share a draft protocol or framework for high rise emergency preparedness that can be customized and applied to other settings. And we've worked with volunteer residents in four high rise building pilot sites in St. Jamestown to develop specific climate emergency preparedness measures and plans for their own buildings. So that's, uh, that's it from me. And I'm gonna pass you now over to you, Lydia. So hello everyone, my name is Lydia Ferreira. I am from CRU and I am the Community Engagement Specialist. Uh, along with some of our key volunteers, I will be telling you about our draft plan for community-led heatway preparedness and response. It was co-created by CRU and T in collaboration with the San Jose Town Climate Action Crew and in consultation with other uh, stakeholders, many of whom are here today. We will continue to test and adapt this protocol with residents and different high rises buildings and activate the protocol when the San Jose Town community experiences heat waves and other extreme weather events and emergencies. This protocol has five focus area to help support residents during a heat wave. Uh, they are the five uh, focus points and uh, our awesome volunteers, they are going to present each of them. So now I'm going to pass you to Hina Bati. Hello everyone, I'm Hina Bhatti and I'm a 19 year old who has been passionately volunteering with crew and T for the past four years or so. Um, I have been living in St. Jamestown for about 11 years now and currently I am a first year student at Queen's University pursuing a bachelor's of science degree in life sciences. Um, so today I will be discussing the first focus point of our protocol which is communication. And this is when all residents receive advanced notification of the heat wave. It is critical to have communication plans in place so that a build, the building residents receive advanced warnings about heat wave through multiple channels, enabling them to be more prepared and make necessary arrangements. It is also important to continue to communicate and check in with residents throughout a heat wave, especially with those who may require support. Now, some ways that we can consider implementing communication systems are as follows. So first of all, we can use a visual alert system in multiple spaces, for example, the lobby, laundry room, or every floor and local community spaces. Secondly, we can check in on residents when a heat, wave, heat alert is issued, and that can be through social channels, door knocking, or the intercom system. Lastly, we can communicate alerts to building staff, uh, community workers, and volunteers and ensure that they are aware of the response plans and part of the alert groups. So after our outreaches and the lobby information events that we had in our building, uh, residents 
are communicating emergency alerts by WhatsApp group and word of mouth. In our building, the primary barrier to implementing our communication strategy is the challenge of obtaining management support for innovative solutions, such as using the building intercom for heat wave alerts, permission to install flag alerts, and providing paper notifications for those who struggle with digital, digital devices. Well, that's it for me. I will now pass it on to Sohal for the second focus point. Hi everyone, my name is Zoha Kiyumi. I am 24 years old and a little bit about me is that I graduated from George Bryan College in the Early Childhood Education Program. I have lived in St. Jamestown for over 15 plus years and have been a volunteer with CRU for over two years. Now I'm going to present the second focus point of the heat wave protocols, homes. So homes, residents' homes are kept as cool as possible. Helping residents to have measures in place to keep their homes as cool as possible during a heat wave can help mitigate risk and prevent harm from heat wave impacts. There are simple measures that residents can prepare in advance of a heat wave and longer term measures that require support from the building management, landlord, or housing provider. So we can go further more into what this means. So this means distributing information and engaging with residents with accessible ways to stay cool in their homes. For example, having fans, uh, keeping water and ice in the fridge and maintaining emergency kits. Also conducting outreach activities outside or inside buildings to increase awareness. For example, having an info table in the lobby, uh, having conversations and surveys with residents, handing out materials and supplies, and having discussions about long-term measures and tenant supports. During the adaptation process of the heatwave protocol in my building, we learned that we can use the empty room in the lobby as a way to engage with residents about heat waves, emergency preparedness, and creating their own emergency kit. The barrier is working with management in the building for the empty room to turn into a resilience hub for residents in the building of emergencies such as heat waves. Now, I'm going to pass to Gita. Hello, everyone. I am Gita Kumari. I came from India with my husband and son. I hold a master's degree in commerce. We have been living in St. Jamestown from last two and a half years. Since last year, I am volunteering this project. Now I'm going to present about the heat wave protocols focus point, pool area and cooling space. During a heat wave, high rise resident may need to leave their homes if they become too hot. Residents need an accessible cool space, preferably in their own building, that is equipped to comfortably accommodate everyone who needs it. If the building does not have a suitable space with enough capacity, residents may need to access a nearby cool space. In nearby public or community building, the landlord must post the location of the nearest cool space either inside or near the building as required by law. Resident assess nearby cool space if their home is too hot. Identify and establish well-marked cool space in each building. For example, residential cool room with AC, water, chairs, and other space in building that can be used. Plan with partners for opening accessible cool spaces in the neighborhood for all residents. For example, community centers, libraries, schools. And so residents know where cool space are in their building and neighborhood, and plans are in place for residents who need support to reach them. During the adaptation process of the protocol in my building, residents discuss the importance of having outdoor cooling space, sitting area outside of the building. We have plenty of empty grasses, but the main barrier is to work with the management to make it reality. Now I'm passing to Anusen. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Anushin, I'm 20 years old, and I'm currently going to be a first year student at TMU studying environmental and urban sustainability. And I've been living in St. Jamestown for pretty much all my life. Uh, next slide, please. So contact systems, um, uh, contact systems are allow residents to receive a check-in and support if they need it. The core foundation for community-led Heat wave preparedness and response is a neighbors helping neighbors approach. Local volunteers know their neighbors, building, and community best. It is important to have an organized group in each building that understands what to do to support residents before, 
during, and after a heat wave, and is supported by building management and local service providers within the community. Some examples, um, we, we can convene and train a mutual support group that includes volunteers on every floor. We can set up an opt-in contact system for residents for sharing heat alerts and providing information and support during and after heat waves. We can identify residents who want to extra support during a heat wave and connect with local agencies, supporting clients in the building. And we can also conduct outreach at the start of summer to provide info on heat protocols, tool spaces, and local resources before they even hit us. So during the protocol adaptation outreaches we've had in my building, we've been able to create our own strong WhatsApp group of volunteers on different floors of my building. And one barrier we um, we face is that a lot of our residents don't originally weren't originally born in Canada and are in fact immigrants, so not all of them may fully understand English. So having someone who can speak multiple languages can be a great asset for us. And another barrier is that we are just tenants. Uh, we need support from our management and agencies to help us pr by providing us with resources such as easy access to our meeting room within our building. Uh, and I will now be passing it on to Sarah. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Buchanan from T from Toronto Environmental Alliance, and uh, my camera is uh, is off today. My internet is broken, uh, and so if I try to turn on my camera, it'll probably break it even more. Uh, so really excited to have you all here today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the support services section of our plan here, and uh, the core of this category is really making sure that residents can uh, access local support services like medical care or, or food and water even, or help getting where they need to go in a heat wave. And this means, uh, practically, it means building relationships with local support providers, local agencies, uh, governments, programs, and, and physical spaces as well that can support residents during a heat wave, uh, especially residents who are made most vulnerable and may need more support. And there are many residents um, who may need more help getting the care they may regularly rely on, like local programs or health services. So doing work beforehand in each building to find out what kind of support may be needed for the people uh, they know can help uh, uh, build a plan in advance is really important. It's also important to talk through the extra support that people might need from outside agencies or governments that they may not realize they need until an emergency hits. If, for example, the power goes out and uh, in, in tall buildings, many people don't actually have water when the power goes out for an extended period of time, um, it's important to talk through what might happen in this situation. So what about seniors who might have trouble or folks with mobility issues who might have trouble leaving their apartment but don't have running water to help them cool down? What about parents uh, with babies and young children? These are all important questions to talk through with people in each building and to talk through with partner agencies, uh, governments, and other folks who uh, can provide a really healthy support network for your heat wave protocol uh, in the community that you're in. I'm going to stop there and I'm gonna actually pass it over to Mahisha. Take it away, Mahisha. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'll be, my name is Mahisha, I'm from T and I'm the data and engagement specialist. I'll be sharing some key findings from two surveys that were done during this project. The first survey's purpose was to understand how aware and prepared uh, residents of high rises in St. Jamestown were to extreme heat and heat waves. There were 99 residents that completed this survey, of which 75 were not aware of the cities or other cooling spaces in their neighborhood. This highlighted a major gap of awareness around services that are available to um, and the need for more to be done to help residents prepare for heat waves. Also, 69% of the participants responded that they were either uncomfortable or extremely uncomfortable in their homes during heat waves. For the second survey, residents in St. Jamestown were asked about the draft heat wave protocol, and 49 people uh, completed the survey, of which 92 felt like um, the protocol would work in St. Jamestown. Over 95% of the respondents also felt it was extremely important for the heat wave team to advocate for a maximum temperature of 26 degrees Celsius in apartments. And it's important to note that Toronto currently doesn't have 
a maximum indoor temperature bylaw. I'll now hand it over to MA to share some more learnings and recommendations. Thanks very much, Mahisha. And uh, my name is MA, I'm from T. Wonderful again to see everybody on this Zoom webinar. I'm just gonna go over some learnings and recommendations from our team. Some of which I think you'll pick up were, you know, learnings that we got directly from our community volunteers and their experiences in their buildings. So to start out, as you can see at the core of our project is really our local volunteer group. And really this takes a lot of time and capacity building and dedicated resources to work together around, you know, building the, the capacity for folks to reach out to their neighbors. In, in terms of the heart of this work, it is a neighbors helping neighbors model. And we feel that there needs to be deeper conversations around how to resource and compensate such groups for the really important work that they do, they do and will increasingly need this work um, moving into the future. Contact systems like the one we've described are really about communications, relationships, and trust. So we've seen some really positive developments in this work because those relationships have been built with residents in these buildings over time. We're seeing folks on the volunteer team who have reached out to their neighbors continuously to build up that trust so that when there is an emergency, they are able to make contact with their neighbors and assist them. But this is not something that we can take for granted. And sometimes we find that folks are wary. Um, and so we need to acknowledge that this is long work. Um, it's not short term work and that it's really about building, you know, social cohesion um, in these buildings. As we've talked about a little bit, um, many residents are made, made vulnerable to extreme weather due to factors such as their housing conditions, income, and social is isolation. So we need to recognize the equity issues surrounding this. And in addition to that, plans are needed to assist residents who may have acute needs during emergencies. We cannot leave that burden completely on the shoulders of volunteers. And so when we're talking about the experience of heat waves in high rise apartment buildings, what we've heard is that there are some immediate measures that can be put in place to protect residents, both in terms of their own apartments, as well as the common spaces. So some of our volunteers spoke about how they are utilizing common spaces in their buildings and also providing information to building residents around what they can do. However, we do want to acknowledge, you know, the structural and systemic issues in these buildings, which do require that building management and landlords participate in these initiatives and support, you know, what they're hearing from tenants are needed in these buildings. We heard a little bit around the need for cool spaces and the challenges that many are ill-equipped and inaccessible to residents. Capacity is a major concern. So we have in the St. James Town community, um, apartment buildings that have many, many tenants. The spaces that are provided as designated cool spaces do not often have the capacity to really handle um, large numbers of residents going to them during a heat wave. As you heard, folks may not be aware where public um, cooling spaces are or may not be able to reach them. So one thing that we've looked at in this project is there are other spaces both in the buildings themselves, but also in and around the community nearby to where folks live that can be that can serve this purpose and can be equipped um, to accommodate residents during a heat wave. We've also learned that it's very important for community voices to inform how local spaces and infrastructure are planned and used. We really need to bring a community climate resilience lens to all planning processes. So when we're thinking about housing developments, green space, community facilities, these are all things that can serve residents during a heat wave, but we need to ensure that those voices are being heard in these planning processes so that we optimize how these things can benefit the community and support emergency preparedness and response. Next slide, please. Lastly, um, our last two points, Community climate preparedness takes a whole ecosystem um, to support residents during you know, emergencies. And we talk about that element of our protocol. So we really need to see local government, community agencies, um, other community organizations coming together to support residents in um, locally generated 
emergency response plans. We Again, we cannot leave um, the sole responsibility to support residents during emergencies on the shoulders of volunteers. What we need to see is everyone working together. So we have had some really encouraging um, sessions, you know, with uh, stakeholders in the St. Jamestown community, and we hope to continue these moving into the future. Residents' knowledge um, and lived experience are truly a valuable resource when we're developing emergency preparedness plans. And during our project, we've taken a co-creation approach um, with our St. Jamestown Action Crew volunteers to really develop a protocol that speaks to what they've experienced in their buildings and what they hope for the future of their community. So again, I would like to really thank our volunteers for bringing that to our project, for helping us um, develop these important learnings. And we will be looking to develop further recommendations and share these with you. At this point, we have reached the point where we will be happy to have some Q&A and discussion. Um, so I will hand over to Sarah to facilitate that. And maybe we can have it so that we can all see uh, faces for those who are able to have their, their videos on. I'm going to actually throw it right over to Jess, uh, who has just mentioned the video is ready to go. Oh, so excellent. Uh, yeah, right. well, we will be doing a Q&A after that. So feel free to hold your questions or pop them in the Q&A now um, and while we're watching the video. All right. Um, so video is ready to go now. So um, as mentioned before, this was very much a labor of love from everybody um, involved here today, as well as many others. And we want to give a special thanks to the editor and the videographer, Marco, who did an absolutely fantastic job. Um, all right. So here we go. Hi, my name is Selva. I've lived in St. Jamestown for for all 19, 20 years of my life. And I have been living here since two years. I've lived in St. Jamestown for over 20 years. Last 11 years. More than 10 years. I've been living in St. Jamestown for the past 11 years or so. is such an important group to have in our community, especially in a community with over 18,000 people officially and 30,000 people unofficially with many high rise buildings where we you know, go through so many extreme weather events such as heating, um, heat extreme events, um, power outages. Um, where we experience a whole blackout in our buildings. Uh, the focus of the population is mostly about income generation and, uh, and the renting space. And uh, the environmental concerns are not a, are always set aside because of this. So crew primarily works in this level where we try to educate our residents about the importance of um, the heat wave impacts and uh, any climatic changes that is happening within the community. So this work is, uh, to me, it seems crucial because it allows people to not only be educated but also help prepare for the problem. In addition to that, it also strengthens the community's resilience and also raises the awareness of the, the fact that climate change is actually real. 30 degrees is quite not, not no, it's normal for me from where I belong to. So, but when I came here and when his temperature is just 28 or 29, I feel that it's too hot and and what I can relate is, it's it's not about the only about the temperature. It's about the building, the structure that I have been living living there. So it's the heat is more trapped there. There is no more so no uh, proper ventilation. There should be some policy or the legislation that the city should uh, create. Maybe in the uh, during the summer time, if the if there is a legislation that the building must manage the temperature within 24 to 26 degree, then that could be at least helpful for the uh, those vulnerable people or every community who have been living in that case as well. I was able to understand how the inequality of what's going on in our neighborhood when it comes to heat waves. How the closest cooling space is almost 50, like a 15 minute walk away, which is pretty inaccessible for the elderly, the disabled, and whatnot and how the closest green space we got, which was built pretty recently, 
was like pretty is like close to a dumpster which is like i don't think anyone really wants to sit there and some other green spaces is just like grass and like a children's park and that's really about it this is something i feel like not everyone sees on a daily basis but thanks to crew i've been able to work with them and we're able to understand and tell the city we need this to be fixed because this project is about bringing people together in uh, these communities with a lot of people that may not know each other. In Canada, we have a challenge in knowing our neighbors in a lot of communities, especially ones where there's a lot of people coming that are new and from different countries. So being able to connect on something and to build that cohesion is really critical and to use that to prepare for emergencies, whether they're climate emergencies or other things that can happen. So when you get to know each other, you can prepare well for these events. So we have this beautiful area that is renovated with parks, a basketball playground, sitting areas. But the one thing is that we can't have many trees here because there is parking underneath this ground. We could uh, make a structure that holds fans that throw mists at people when, during a heat wave to cool them down and which could relax them and lower the heat in their body. This project provides me an opportunity to make an, uh, a real um, difference to people. Like we can provide the information to all people and uh, like they are safe and they have lots of resources to do all those kind of the stuff. So I believe that spreading knowledge to the uh, other is a power and by educating our um, community about extreme weather, uh, extreme weather event, we can empower individuals um, to protect them. I love the fact that uh, we get to go to, as a group together and we able to address the concerns uh, as, a, as a community. And we also see the response from the community has been really amazing. Uh, as we have seen that this mist station is uh, close to this Hawali Street and, uh, and this looks very uh, user-friendly or we can say it's friendly to all from the children to the seniors and all the people in the St. Limstown community. And we expect that uh, maybe the community or the city of Toronto can uh, build up this, install this message station in other park. So we hope that our voices and, you know, and our group, such as Crew, Community Resilience, Extreme Mother, can be a voice uh, to other communities to build their own organizations to extreme weather events and also just empower people to have a voice where they don't have one as well. My thinking is if we are uh, working in the community, if we are working in the neighborhood, like we are all are same. So we have to raise the voice in the same way so we can work together and we can solve all those problems in a good way. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Jessica, for that amazing uh, video and for pulling it all together with, with Marco, the filmmaker. And thanks to everyone who was in the video, many of whom are actually on this um, on this call right now. Um, and we are now going to move on to a bit of a Q&A section. I see the questions are rolling in, which is awesome. Thank you, everyone, for um, for doing that. Um, and we're going to kind of casually direct the questions or open them up to the folks who are in our volunteer and project team here um, to try to answer them as best we can. Um, and I also want to say that th we've had a couple questions about, you know, whether we'll, we're sending around the video or materials. Uh, short answer is yes. Anyone who's signed up for this webinar, we're going to be following up by email with uh, more things than you can possibly ever read. And uh, it may not be right away today, um, but we are gonna send along some some materials, including the protocol uh, and the plan, and uh, and I believe the video as well, um, and, uh, and a link to the recording when that's done as well, so that you can share this wonderful webinar with everyone you know, of course. 
Um, so I'm going to go to a first question here in the Q&A, and I know we've had a couple in the chat as well, so I'll try to get to those too. Um, there's a question from Beatrice um, about how much cooling spaces in buildings, uh, how much are they actually being used by tenants? And maybe I'll ask if actually if any of our um, volunteers who live in St. Jamestown are maybe able to speak to uh, to this in your building, um, you know, are people are there cool spaces within the building? And if so, do people actually use them? Uh, Beatrice says, you know, uh, I've heard they're they are not used sometimes for reasons like safety concerns. They're boring, or people have to return and people have to return to hot apartments in the evening. Um, what do residents say might make these spaces more engaging and fun to go to? Um, so maybe I'll just pause for a second and see. If we have a, a volunteer who wants to talk a little bit about how well used uh, cooling spaces in your building are and if they exist. Uh, I can answer that question. Um, so in some of my some of the building that we worked with during our outreach campaigns, uh, there are uh, rooms that are being used uh, just with like safety equipment or like cleaning equipment. So it's used for um, more of a storage space, which is why maybe residents don't feel it's as engaging or would want to use that room. So just having that communication with, you know, management about discussing of using that room as a way for people to use as a cooling room or as a resilience house, which I did speak about before. It's just having that communication with management, which is very key to opening those cooling spaces for residents. Hopefully I answered your question. Uh, you, I'd like to add on, just to add on a little something as well. Um, so also just a lot of the, like our spaces within our building, they feel like they're not welcome to for residents to, for you to use. Like we have one space that, as as well said that's being used as storage. There's like another room that's being used as like an ESL class that I didn't even know existed. It, it was a very nice room too. It was like a a two like part room. Like one ha one part of it had like a kit like a really nice kitchen. Another part was being used as a classroom. It was such a nice room. And I'm like, I'm just wondering why is that I've lived in this building for so long and yet I've never known this building existed as well. And um another and there's also like a little door that says library on it. And perhaps that could be a fun little like area for people to study in, like um a quiet library that's just not that's not too far from their actual home, easy to study, and maybe they might have books that they don't want anymore. They can donate it to that little library. I don't know, just some little thing like that to bring in some community within our building itself. That's a great point too, uh, Anushin, talking about, you know, the point about, oh, maybe people don't use the spaces because they could get boring. Uh, if you had a, a library or like sharing shelves or something in some of those spaces that could do, you know, double duty as well. If they're being used as a cooling space, there's there might be materials for people to to access as well. Um, yeah, Lydia, so, um, yeah, yeah, I want to add that uh, it's very interesting, like about during this process, like uh, all the volunteers they were starting uh, looking around, and uh, they can see that it's too much, uh, many potential for community cool cooling places around all these different buildings, and uh, so now uh, basically as we crew, we have uh, this small space in one of the Toronto community housing buildings, so we are like uh, having that for like. Uh, a weekly space. We can say like half a space right now because it's like yeah, we are using that with uh, the management team. So um, little by little we are getting there. So basically it's, it's like uh, every single building is very interesting. We have a, like a uh, unused spaces that potentially can be um, resilient hubs or something like uh, where tenant can get together and to create this kind of like a uh, community resilient. Thanks, Lydia. Um, any any other folks want to comment on the cooling spaces in the building? Okay. I think I, I, I could just offer that um uh I think perhaps um you, you know, certainly through the pandemic and maybe even prior to that, some of those, as Anushim has said, 
there there are lots of there's lots of smaller spaces that are accessible right there in the neighborhood um but sort of uh working out how we can comfortably access those um uh and uh you know and and also ideally uh, ensure that they have some sort of air conditioning um all of that is still in process and i think um the most important thing to know about this project is that it takes time and um, uh, time for building trust on uh, on on all sides. Um, but I'm really confident that we'll get there. Um, and uh, and I think that um, when when the weather really does heat up, um, um, it, the the sort of uh, amenities in the room will be less important than the fact that the room is cold but of course along with that is people's knowledge about what happens to a body as it heats up and that's also a very important piece because if you don't understand that you're um in a sort of hazardous uh at hazardous temperatures um you're not as uh, motivated to access that green space so it all sort of wraps around and that's um and that's uh, as as we've said um where we would hope to have uh, support from from other other folk, other stakeholders, and um, but keep passing along those those pieces of essential um, information. Okay, thanks, Sheila. Um, we've had a few questions actually about the participation of building owners and building management. So I want to kind of roll them into maybe one question to open up to our our panel here. Um, you know what kind of what kind of work have we done with building owners and managers? What kind of response have we found? I know folks noted that that was you know sometimes a barrier to moving forward some of uh, these ideas. Um, but I, I should know we have also worked with uh, Toronto Community Housing um, and definitely had uh, some communication there and and uh, you know achieved some steps forward. Um, maybe I'll pass it first to Lydia, who's. Uh, who's led a lot of those interactions and then just open it up really to anyone who wants to talk more about that. Yeah, I just want to say that when we started this project, so we uh, start communicating with all these different like um, uh, building management. So we invite them to be part of these processes. And uh, also we ask uh, some permission that we can like all these kind of outreach and lobby information session events. So more of them, they say yes to us, um, but then we try very like, um, basically it's like working very more direct with the Toronto housing people. And uh, so that is why right now we have this uh, um, weekly space in uh, one of the buildings. So the whole idea is to start connecting with more uh, different management and different buildings. So because it's like, uh, it's very amazing that during our outreach event and talking with people who are living there for many, many years. So all of them, they mentioned that uh, before, like uh, I say before, maybe 30, 40 years ago. So they have uh, access to all these amazing recreation spaces. So that was more like a kind of community uh, spaces site to celebrate kind of like uh, the neighborhoods. But then suddenly something happened. So I'm not sure what, why, but, uh, um, until today, basically, is uh, none of that is uh, available. So we are like uh, right now with all these amazing volunteers. So we are start like uh, looking around and trying to figure out. So why we don't have uh, access to all these different spaces or to make again this uh, kind of community like a uh, kind of a very vibrant community again. So, um, so that is what I I will say, um, Sarah. So basically, is we invite all these building man manager to work with us. Uh, we have a positive reform from Toronto Housing. Great. Anybody else want to, you know, mention any uh, any barriers or possible inroads related to to building owners or managers? I should mention that it, it was uh, primarily rental buildings that we worked with with this pilot. Um, you know, T has, has done other work and other projects with, uh, for example, co-op buildings or, or condos as well. And I think that every, each type of building has its own unique, uh, challenges, I guess, for, uh, for making, you know, changes to, to physical parts of the building and also for, uh, being able to reach people. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed 
first about this project um, is that, you know, is immediately the, the value of the deep work that this group, um, you know, originally with, with crew uh, and these volunteers has been doing over the years and the value in being able to reach so many residents in the buildings and so many tenants. So um, I think that there's been a lot of amazing work there. Um, and, and I think that, you know, there, there are definitely like a learning from this project was that, um, yeah, reach sometimes reaching the building owners and managers can be, uh, can be tough and, uh, there's more work to do there, I think, to get, um, to get better communication channels. So if anyone has advice about that from other cities, we also really welcome that as well. You can either, uh, pop it in the chat or reach out to us at the email addresses we, we put in there. Um, I'm going to go to another question here. Um, I'll just pop over to the Q&A. So one question is, what, uh, what advice would you have for a new housing development uh, that wants to put in place physical elements to support uh, future uh, program and communications? What are the priority physical infrastructure to put in place? And I would assume that means to, you know, to help uh, mitigate uh, the impacts of heat waves. So folks that, you know, if you could design a new community from the ground up uh, to be able to do this kind of support work, what would you put in place? I can go, Sarah, if you want so then. Uh, what I will say is like I'm learning uh, after our like our community work and suggest uh, like I'm working with all this building that they built uh, in 1960. So without uh, having in mind that our planet is going to be hotter and hotter. So basically the whole building was prepared for winter. And um, like for example, like all this building uh, didn't have it doesn't have any like proper ventilation or like uh, for example like uh, windows and um, it's not prepared to hold ACs. So what I will say is like uh, if something is going to be very new, so basically is to have that kind of like um, in mind like a structure about like um, proper ventilation, more community spaces. Uh, we need we are humans, so we need to get together. We need to know each other. And that is so important to have our like spaces inside and outside the building. So basically, it's like uh, it's, for me, it's crucial to see emergency hubs in every single building, so where people can get together and start discussing all these different issues. To have other uh, spaces for like uh, emergency kits, like for example, right now what we have uh, and uh, and all this building in Sajistan is amazingly, it's like uh, all this building they have more or less the same layout. Uh, the design was more or less the same. Um, so like a family of five or eight people living in a tiny apartment, so they don't have a storage room. So like for example, they cannot have a like, um, when they are sheltering in place, all these emergency supplies or like a kit. So what I say is like to have that in mind. So basically it's to have more spaces for people inside their, their apartment inside the building to get together, that is crucial. We need to know each other, we need to work together and also outdoor spaces where we can also have a, like a, a gathering kind of activities so we can get together. So that is what is totally missing uh, in our, when we were looking around San Gisela. So maybe Anushan, you want to add something? Yeah, I was just gonna say like um maybe just have some green spaces nearby, like nothing too crazy, just a nice uh, green space, maybe a little park for kids, a bunch of trees for natural shade, maybe some misting stations as well. Yeah, just something simple like that. I feel like that can just go a long way. Yeah, shade really came up quite a lot in our conversations as an important thing. Uh, for people, you know, both talking about areas that are currently shaded where people can go and making sure, um, you know, those uh, remain accessible, like the school was, was brought up as a, as a place actually that has a lot of trees on the school grounds, the Rose Avenue uh, Public School, um, and then ideas for where, you know, there could be more shade added. Um, I'm going to move to another question here, um, asking about, uh, from Jacqueline here, asking 
how does this protocol apply to um, people with disabilities or el elderly people? Do you have any recommendations for how to make sure people who aren't able to leave their apartments easily to stay cool during extreme heat events? Um, maybe actually, maybe um, Anushin or or Hina or Zahal or Gita, I'll ask you to talk about some of the work that I, I know that you have done. You know, knocking on doors or, or checking in with folks, and and how this might apply. Uh, you want to start, oh, Anushin? Yeah, you can go first. Uh, we just started discussing about having floor captains on each floor, either one or two. Um, just getting a database of who can be a floor captain that knows everybody in their floor and then gathering that and moving forward with having um, training sessions to make sure they're prepared in case of emergencies such as heat waves. And then also gathering information, how many vulnerable uh, residents there are on each floor in the building um, and using that database to be able to provide help um, during heat waves. So that's kind of what we're focus on, focusing on for right now and slowly building that, um, you know, uh, database of how many people there are, vulnerable people there are, especially residents. We have a, a lot of elderly residents in our community, and especially my building. So just um, getting that database and hopefully moving forward with that as a stepping stone for the future. Awesome. And yeah, and I think that really also speaks to the need for support services in the neighborhood, because when we have a dedicated team of volunteers who are doing things like reaching out to neighbors or making databases, uh, those volunteers also need to be empowered with, um, you know, places to maybe refer to or to 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 call up to bring in support services or health services or or things um, that, you know, th things where, when you might need someone to come in um, and help someone out in an emergency. So that's where, um, you know, we would call on um, external agencies um, or governments uh, to to provide a little bit of help in, in that area. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, first, I'm actually going to say that since we're close to 1 p.m., um, I just want to acknowledge there might be some uh, people who have to head out, and that's totally fine. I'm going to give you an opportunity to take a graceful exit at 1 if you need to, but we're going to stay uh, on the line here to talk a little bit more since there are so many questions and we've cleared we cleared the next half hour um, in, if anyone does want to stick around and continue the conversation. I'll mention again that we're going to be emailing out some materials to everyone, uh, including the recording, um, and uh, and that I think someone popped our email addresses in the chat, but maybe someone can do that again just in case anyone wants to get in touch. Um, so, okay, what is another question here? Um, here's, here's a question actually probably for you, Sheila. Um, and Lydia, uh, this is so inspiring. How can other neighborhoods in Toronto get crew support to start a project like this? Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, I'll, I'll very happily answer that question. Um, uh, we have a, a very recently um, developed a workbook um, of our, our particular approach to uh, this work. Um, and there are, as Sarah has said, quite a number of materials that have come out of this project that support the kind of work um, as it uh, relates directly to heat waves. So um, we're very ready to share those um, with other communities. Uh, we, crew has, very limited capacity, but I think the materials now um, um, will do a lot of their own work and then we can always be um, uh, accessible for support um, of any community efforts around this. So we'd love to see that happening um, and we'll work hard to build capacity um, to give greater support to these sorts of um, um, community group sort of grassroots uh, responses. We think they're we know they're so important and we'd love to see them everywhere there's a need. Great. Um, I see another question here um, about, um, oh, sorry, I was reading the wrong one here. 
I see actually a few questions kind of on a similar theme of like how to, you know, the importance of maybe getting some sort of regulations or policies placed at, um, and not just at the city level, probably also at provincial and, and federal level too, but maybe I can just, you know, ask in general, um, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of policies would we want to see to help, uh, to help with heat wave situations? We know that summers are getting hotter. We know that this isn't going to get any easier. Um, so what kind of policies could be put in place uh, now to try to uh, to try to to mitigate the impacts that we we know might be coming. Um, actually, I may maybe I'll throw this first uh, to you, unless anybody else is super enthusiastic here, um, and uh, we can talk a little bit about that. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks for the questions. And what I will say is that while this wasn't a project that was specifically designed um, to talk about policy, what we found in our community conversations is that our volunteers and community members did raise the, these questions. Um, so they came up directly from the community. We've spoken a little bit about um, the maximum heat bylaws. And so that's something that's under consideration at the City of Toronto. I think somebody mentioned in the chat um, around Hamilton's progress. And, you know, just one thing that came up in our community conversations is that if there's a bylaw for temperatures around cold and, you know, apartments not dropping below a certain temperature, should that not be a consideration um, for tenants and residents' health in apartment buildings when it comes to heat? So that's something um, that's certainly been a focus of our conversations um, here in Toronto uh, around a maximum heat bylaw. And I think, you know, we have to think about what is being projected weather-wise in our future. And we certainly know, um, and, and the city has released figures um, for some time about this, that we're looking at increasing numbers of extreme heat days. And so part of that is, you know, looking at how policy needs to evolve as quickly as possible to address um, the forecast um, of the future, but also, you know, the the weather uh, fluctuations and the pattern that we're seeing now. Um, so we don't have a long timeline um, to get things in place. And certainly what we're hoping is that all the policy developments around this area will be informed by community voices. So consultation needs to be meaningful. Um, it needs to be deep. We need to understand people's lived experiences of these things, which is something that our project really aimed um, to do, which is to bring those things to the forefront. So we want to also, you know, encourage that civic participation um, and policy discussions going forward for fo folks who are on the front lines, um, as you heard, is going to be increasingly important. Um, I want to open it out um, to the other folks um, on the webinar as well, you know, particularly um, our volunteers, if you have any thoughts on this that you'd like to share. Maybe, maybe maybe well well volunteers are, are considering that question. I, I can just say that 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 tw maximum twenty six degree um, uh, uh, bylaw um, has to be an essential uh, piece of this work. I think ultimately that's that's what will um, certainly push the needle in terms of of investment in um, sometimes you know buildings that. That are as as Lydia as, as others have said are older buildings. Um, there are lots of um, uh, challenges certainly to get anything to sort of cool those places down, um, and uh, and there'd be a great I and mean, there's obvious reluctance to to sort of step in that direction, especially given the costs. So, um, a bylaw needs to probably come hand in hand with a little bit of support to do that, but. Um, I don't think people will be be volunteering um, to make uh, some of these spaces cooler um, without without the push um, of a twenty six degree bylaw. Yeah, and I I see here you know there's a kind of related question from uh, from Mary talking about how the social infrastructure work is amazing and, and wondering if there's some way to, you know, leverage uh, this and, and sort of transition it also into transforming physical uh, infrastructure and spaces like improved uh, ventilation, window shades, heat pumps. 
uh, things like that. I, I will open up that question to everyone, but I'll, you know, I'll just make a note that I think it is very related to the policy side. And as Sheila noted, you know, it, it is very difficult to, to do these kinds of things as suggestions or as polite, uh, <laughs> you know, polite suggestions to building owners to say, hey, it would be great to have, you know, ventilation or uh, window shades. Um, and that's really where, uh, where policy can come in and, and help out on that side. Um, yeah, any other ideas for how we, we make that shift from um, transforming social infrastructure into also transforming physical infrastructure. I just want to say also is like a Sarah that uh, for example is like uh, working with all these volunteers. It's amazing to see that uh, half of them they don't have a steel AC. So like uh, how we can start like, uh, pushing that having air conditioning and want and your rental apartment needs to be like a human right. I will say that. As for me, it's very interesting, like um many volunteers, they still they don't have any 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 type of air conditioning in their apartments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point too about how there there's a variety of existing, you know, cooling techniques. There's some some air conditioning, many places without air conditioning. I've heard some people mention that fans work in their place and some people mention that the fans just blow around hot air. Uh, so depending on the ventilation situation um, or even the window situation, there's there's current bylaws saying you can't fully, uh, windows get, can't be allowed to be fully open in most of these buildings. Uh, and there there are steps to try to change that bylaw, but that that really prevents a whole lot of air circulation as well. Um, I'm going to shift gears uh, with this question, this next question a little bit. Um, this is uh, a question from Molly for the St. James Volunteers. What do you need, like what kind of support do you need to be successful in reaching out to residents and to sustain your efforts over time? And what do you need to prevent burnout uh, from doing so much of this wonderful work? Uh, to answer your question, just I guess we just need more support from support services around the community. Um, just as a stepping stone, uh, it is. I know we do have you know support from crew. We have support from T, uh, which is super like it's great. We had like it's such a stepping stone for us because you know when we when you have no support, it's very difficult to you know be that voice to make initiative. Uh, you know, from crew and T, we started making our own St. Jason Climate Action Crew, which was so amazing. You know, we had so many volunteers that were so interested. So just having a lot of support from our building, from like, around the community as well. In terms of burnout, it's just having, sometimes we do have discussions where we just come together as volunteers and just have like discussion about our lives, you know, what we do in our spare time. And that way we can just get together and discuss, you know, uh, away from our volunteer work, you know, that way we can create a sense of belonging with one another and create a sense of trust with one another. And also just focusing on the neighbors, helping neighbors aspect as well. And in terms of moving forward and how we can continue this work, it just maybe to continue with this work to make sure that it doesn't just stop from here. And we know we just stop and we don't continue on, but getting that funding, continuing this work, making sure that more people are aware of this and how important it is as well. Thanks, Sohal. Any and other? also, uh, Sarah, I just want to mention also, like, I just like following what Sohal say is like, uh, uh, we especially like uh, during the our meetings and activities. So we don't want just to be the bad guys telling that everything is awful and uh, everything is like uh, doesn't have any solution or something like that. But what we try is like uh, to generate like a kind of like a uh, interesting kind of community getting together and also uh, doing fun activities like for example like uh, going for a long discovery walk having like a potluck uh, lunch all together, uh, discussing our differences, our cultural, religion, faith, or whatever differences, and just embracing that and learning from each other. So that basically is 
uh, in that way, we are making very a strong group. And, uh, and everyone is just like uh, looking forward to continue this kind of work. Thanks, Lydia. Um, one other question that we had uh, in the chat here and kind of has come up is that, you know, do, does the project consider other climate change emergencies or really just other emergencies like uh, tornadoes, uh, something Ken brought up, uh, but also, you know, other other weather emergencies, um, things like power outages, all that kind of thing. So how do we incorporate more than just heat waves into this project? I'm wondering if our volunteers want to share a little bit about the experience with the recent uh, power outage um, and how the work came into play since that was uh, such a recent occurrence um, and a different kind of emergency. Uh, I guess I can I can start talking about that. Um, so when the blackout happened, uh, of course, it was like very sudden. It's not like we had like a, a warning beforehand that it was going to happen. And um, but at first, I thought perhaps it was just something in my apartment. I thought maybe, oh, something had shortened the fuse or something, only to find out that it was affecting the entire neighborhood as well. So it was definitely it was definitely alarming. But for one first thing I did was make sure that my family was OK, make sure my phones were charged and make sure just everything I have is just close by and ready to go and making sure I just do the right things that I need to do just in case, find out why is this power outage happening? How long is it going to happen? Uh, would, do I need to do anything else to prepare myself? And yeah. Um, one thing what I noticed is that our the outside of my built, like the hallway, um, that the power was still working there. So it, had I need them to charge my phone, I'd be able to charge it outside. Um, I saw other people in my on my floor as well just going going outside, charging their phone, <laughs> watching their um, videos, TV shows, whatever. And um, yeah, it, I think it's, uh, it, it was a good learning a lesson for everyone. And I, th I think that hopefully that also made some other people in my building prepare themselves next time for any future emergencies such as that. <laughs> And I know for us, when it did happen, uh, it was kind of like, what's going on? What's happening? And we, as a family, just came together. And, you know, since I have younger siblings with me, they did get a little bit scared, but we did reassure them. Um, I do did have data on my phone, so I did open up uh, my WhatsApp because we do have a WhatsApp group with our other volunteers. So we're just catching up with one another, making sure they're we're have all of our um, necessary items and I know with crew we do had uh, we had training session where we talk about emergency preparedness and specifically about the emergency kit so I know I was slowly building up my own with a first aid kit a flashlight um, a power cord so I made sure that um, since we needed to charge our phones I had the power cord extension so like Anushin said uh, the hallways were the lights were working the Power outlets were working, so I made sure I put the power extension cord on so we had our phones charging or if we wanted to make tea or if we wanted to do anything with the power extension cord, we were good to go. And just make sure our neighbors were okay. We do have an elderly neighbor in front of us, so making sure she was okay and she did stay with us for a bit. Uh, but having that training session in mind and making sure that um, having the emergency kits and slowly building that up really did help um during that power outage and just having that contact group with other volunteers really did make uh feel okay that we do have one another in case of emergency such as these one thing i maybe would invite lydia and sheila to comment on is something that really drew us to cruise work um from t's perspective so during the pandemic, um, as T, we were looking at community-led responses um, in the early period of the pandemic. And one thing that really struck us about your work is that you've been working in the St. James Town community for a while with folks like Sahal and Anushin, and you've been building people's capacity to respond in emergencies, but from a climate preparedness uh, perspective. But when the pandemic hit, 
you were then able to pivot with the volunteers to actually support folks that needed immediate assistance, including isolated seniors. And so for us, that really highlighted, you know, how climate related work can then immediately be valuable in other types of emergencies. In this case, we were we were experiencing a health emergency, obviously. So maybe I would invite you also just to, to speak about that, because we often think about what we can learn from other emergency preparedness for climate, but in a way, you know, the work you demonstrated with the volunteers showed us the, the reverse of that. You want to go, Sheila? You, you, you go ahead, Lydia. Okay, what I will say is like uh, for us was crucial to have uh, uh, the group, like uh, the community together. Uh, and uh, what like for example, during that time was a, was a group that still is a very important uh, tool for us. And uh, what I will say is yes, for crew is that like we are like uh, working and bringing community people together to know each other, to have that kind of friendship. But also it's like, uh, it's known as those works. So like for example, like uh, for me, Suhal, Anushen, and all these volunteers, they are part of my life. And whatever happens, so I, uh, we are always ready to chat or regardless of Sunday uh, night or something like that, or something happens. So we are always like, uh, trying to be together. Um, and that kind of community sense when we, when the pandemic uh, happened to us. So basically is we were, ready to start connecting to everyone and to see who was vulnerable or who can start like delivering food or something like that. So that was quite very quick and easy to start doing that during the pandemic. I think the key is you need to have the community together and you need always to feed that community that is important to continue together. Like first of all, I will say like uh, last Saturday, we have a, this kind of like a final get together to finalize about this project. But uh, for us, it didn't finish. It's, that it's not just the end. So this is a continuation. So basically it's, it's not like, okay, so we finish here and goodbye, we are not going to see you anymore. So for crew is like, uh, we are continue working and we are going to build up about this and how about this group from this neighborhood, they're going to different neighborhoods and they start like spreading this kind of work by how important it is to be together, to learn together and, and start basically is like learning how we need to deal with our new environment and to adapt to that. Sheila? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think all of that is good. I think what you know what's essential to cruise what really what's central to it is building social networks. And in a place like a, a very dense and diverse neighborhood like St. Jamestown in a huge neighborhood, um, uh, th that that can take some facilitation. Um, I did note uh, there was something in the chat about uh, training for for certainly for residents uh, for for volunteers and residents are invited to larger meetings to sort of learn about some of these issues. But it's the it's the neighbors helping neighbors piece that is is critical. And um, and uh, and then those those spaces, those that we've talked about where people can come together and get to know each other, make friends, make new relationships. Those are really important to support that neighbors helping neighbors um, um, response and connections. Um, and then, yes, there are the challenges. Somebody said something about how do you how do you um, prevent burnout with all of this? And I think um, these this is all volunteer work on the part of the um, uh, St. Jamestown uh, Climate Action Crew. But, um, um, you know, it's as an org organization's T and crew um, prioritize honorariums for their work. So there's a, you know, there's a funding question there. How can that be continued? Can the work be continued? Um, because we, those, our current volunteers will always need to be, and it's continuous, believe me, on a weekly basis, new people appear and are enthusiastic. Um, so, so bringing in new people, keeping, keeping the, the, um, the response, neighbors helping neighbors response current, that's, that's tremendously important. And then just to sum up on that question about how does this work apply to other emergencies? all the way it applies because it's this, again, the social network. So all of the tools that are used to um, respond to a climate impact like a heat wave, are, um, other than the specifics like, you know, ice in the freezer, if you've in the freezer part of your fridge, 
Um, other than those specifics, the tools are the same. It's about outreach, knowing who's really vulnerable and uh, and knowing how hopefully with support, how to how to help them. And also I just want to mention that uh, it's a very important moment when you are also like, uh, let's say like uh, training people or, or we are learning together what something happens. Like for example, during the, the last uh, power outage, so we were in the in the WhatsApp group chatting all together, but also it's like a training, people who knows what to do, telling other what to do, and also like a learning about sanitation, what happened if we don't have a water for like a, for two more hours, so we have a three or four kids, uh, or like for example, like um, how we can't, uh, if it's going to be for more than 24 hours, so how we are going to keep our uh, food and the free and the, the fridge and something like that. So that was very interesting about like all this exchange about like how you need to do, what you need to do. And also it's like a very quick learning process, especially when uh, the emergency is going on. <laughs> Um, there's one one question in here um, that I'd like to get to, uh, asking if pets are included as part of this protocol, which I know is something that did come up in, in some of the conversations we had. Um, I don't know how many pets there are in, in all the buildings, but uh, obviously there's there's some pets that, that might need some cooling as well. Uh, maybe I'll just open it up and see uh, if, uh, if there's any thoughts on that. Uh, well, I can I can confidently say that we have quite a lot of dog owners within our neighborhood. I mean, it'd be pretty impossible just for you to go on a 15 minute walk without seeing at least a couple of dogs around. So um, I guess one way we have been able to at least implement pets as well is that you can have um, your uh, pets uh, food and in into your emergency kit as well as like a part of your emergency kit rather. So they can have at least something for like the next 72 hours that you you need to fend for yourself and um yeah and i guess the same uh, cooling like um diy cooling technique can also apply to them giving them cold water just giving them a nice cold towel i feel like that those can all sort of apply to them as well yeah sarah we always discuss also that that uh, like for several like uh, because we are like having this meeting and all these different lobby areas and some of the buildings say that the cooling area in that building is the lobby and sometimes you can see like a four people with dogs, uh, they, they took the entire lobby area. So basically it's, it's very impossible to put there like 1,500 people with a dog and a cat. So that was also like a very nice discussion that we have with volunteers to see uh, basically that is happening that four people with uh, everyone was having like a two, three dogs and that was the entire lobby taking over, so. Yeah. Um, I've seen a couple questions around the theme of, of what's next, um, you know, how, uh, how do you want this work to move forward into the future? And I know we started to, to talk about it a little bit, um, you know, acknowledging that there's, there's this stage of our work that is, is wrapping up, but as Lydia said, we're definitely not going to just, uh, walk away and, and say, you know, good luck after, um, there's been such momentum and such an amazing engaged, uh, volunteer base and community built. So, um, yeah, I'll open it up to say, what are the next steps? What kind of, what kind of ideal next steps if, if, you know, money and funding weren't, uh, an issue, um, how do we keep this momentum going? What are the ways we can do that? I can start us off maybe um, and then throw to uh, maybe Sheila next. Um, something that has really struck us in this process of working with the community volunteers is just the incredible value of social infrastructure, people, um, and what the what people can do um, when they're organized and they know, you know, how to reach out in a specific situation, they're prepared, they're willing to take up a certain role um, in their community. And I think from T's perspective, it's really our hope um, that we can see investment by multiple levels of government in this kind of social infrastructure or network. 
because we're going to need this more and more. Um, we're going to need this right, you know, coming up in this heat season um, here in Toronto, but we're going to need it for the foreseeable future. So it really is our hope that different municipalities will invest in this. It isn't a one size fits all situation. Um, we hope that we're sharing our draft protocol, as we've been calling it, or framework in such a way um, that folks see value in different communities and that it will inspire deeper investment in this kind of work. I think the the kind of investment in people just goes so far um, and it, it's really, really important. So from T's perspective, it's something that we want to continue to advocate for this kind of resourcing of community and hopefully increased resourcing in different neighborhoods, certainly in our city, but hopefully in other municipalities too. Maybe I'll hand it over to, to Sheila. Thanks, Emily. I think all, all of the all of that is is so true, and I I just want to reiterate what I think is the real importance of um, uh, getting that information out, that critical information, raising awareness more than raising awareness, but actually informing people on what climate impacts are that will locally directly affect them and are, are already in fact affecting them. I I noticed a question in the the chat about the um, uh, smoke from the wildfires last, uh, you know, the, the, there'll be more and more of this. Um, people need to know um, uh, what the effect is on them individually and their families. Um, and we do know, one thing we do know for certain is that people don't read um, sort of general information leaflets. Uh, um, they don't necessarily hear that messaging that comes from um the uh, sort of municipal side or, or all of the people who might might make different sorts of present one-off presentations they don't necessarily reach people in fact I'll, I'll say I don't you know they don't reach many people at all so the importance of hearing that essential stuff from your neighbors um, from your peers who are taking it seriously as a is a sort of uh, puts you on notice to take it seriously yourself so I think that's so important and then our pet, what we'd love to see, since we have all of this funding available now, Sarah, and the sky's the limit, um, we'd love to see um, resilience hubs, um, uh, climate resilience hubs, or simply resilience hubs in lo locally in every uh, in every uh, multiple unit building, um, and make those into places where people can gather to 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 share information, to to make new friends, build new relationships, as I've said before cool off maybe keep their uh, emergency supplies um yeah we there's so much there's so much that we could do and we'd love to see we've talked about this for a long time uh, it's been wonderful to work with t on this and to sort of have have the work amplified in the way that t has so um gracefully done it so thank you t well likewise thank thank you everyone um yeah and, and on the resilience hubs note um i'll mention too uh josephine had popped a couple of things in the chat noting their uh, resilience hubs as well and and something I didn't know is that 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 was there was actually a council resolution apparently to establish those uh, more broadly so I'd love to dive into that a little more um it is uh it is 1 30 p.m and I want to thank everyone so much for coming and answer, asking great questions I'm really sorry we didn't get to every single one of them I tried to kind of work them together into bundles um, but we'll, we'll again be following up with more information, um, and please reach out, you know, if you are inspired and thinking about, uh, doing similar work or starting a group in your building or, or something like that, please do reach out. We'd love to, to chat. Um, and yeah, everyone enjoy. If, if you have sunshine where you are today, please enjoy it. Thanks all.